Okay, so welcome back. This is um, Talking Therapy with me, Devraj, and this week I'm very excited to have Nick Farcher. Hopefully I'm pronouncing your name correctly. I'm not very good at pronouncing TH anyway. Uh, but And, and uh, he's from Falcon Press. I think he's the head of Falcon Press, in fact. We'll find out shortly. Um, so, Nick, welcome. And thank you for um, agreeing to come on and uh, and just having this chat, informal discussion, whatever. And maybe you'd like to introduce yourself and speak a little bit about Falcon Press, your involvement, and and, and whatever you fancy chatting about. Outstanding. Well, thanks very much for having me, Deb. It's a pro pleasure to, to be here and to have a chance to meet you face to face, as it were, for the first time. Uh, as you said, I am indeed the head of. Falcon Press, or the in incarnation called the original Falcon Press. Falcon's had a number of names over the years, all of which have Falcon in there somewhere. And it started off as just Falcon Press back around 1979. So that really dates me. That's over 40 years I've been involved with this <laughs> incredible process. And in, in, uh, Oh, about 1989 or so, we ended up changing the name from Falcon Press to New Falcon Publications because another publishing company in Montana had uh, started a calendar like a few months before we had started in 1979, so they had dibs on the name, Falcon Press Publishing Company. They're gone now, so I suppose the name Falcon Press is available somehow, somewhere, but we're still the original Falcon Press, and that came about, uh, as many of uh, the people who know me uh, are aware, that in 2008, uh, Dr. Christopher Hyatt, uh, who had been the president of Falcon, he passed away, and his biological son did some rather shady things to obtain control of uh, New Falcon Publications. Uh, I found myself then in the position of having to start a new publishing company from scratch in 2008. And here we are 13 years later. That too is astonishing to me. Uh, the, the years keep going by faster and faster until they stop, which is what happens when we get old. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Um I mean, Tree, what would you say was the original kind of motivation uh, to begin Falcon Press uh, at the beginning? Was there like a, you know, was there kind of a mission, not like a mission statement necessarily, but was there what, what was the kind of motivating force, would you say? Wonderful question. There were actually two motivating forces. The first one was Israel Regardi himself. Uh, he and Dr. Hyatt had known each other for years, worked with each other for years. And Regardi had been involved in a lawsuit against his previous publisher, Llewellyn, and in settlement got back the rights to some of his titles and some Crowley titles that uh, he may or may not have had rights to in the first place anyway. So here he is with those titles in his hot little hands, but nobody to publish them. So he says to Hyatt, maybe you publish them. And I said, sure. Now, none of us had any experience in publishing at all, other than the fact that I think uh, I had, had published one title with a totally different publisher once upon a time, so we didn't know squat about the process. So we went ahead and did it anyway. We bought printers and typesetting equipment and photographic equipment, all kinds of stuff. So we would actually do everything in-house, which was a good thing because the prices we were getting from other, pub other printers at that time were just outrageous. You know, they saw us coming a mile away. And so we did it ourselves and ended up doing things in the early 80s, up until the mid 80s, that other experts in the field said simply couldn't be done, like doing multicolor covers on a one color press, which is what we had. Eventually, as the 80s wore on, we were no longer doing most of those things in house. So we sold off the equipment. That's a story in itself, but we can get to that some other time. 
but that was kind of a, a riot. <laughs> we might remember to tell that story one time. And uh, we continued to do all of the typesetting in-house, cover design oftentimes, although we had a lot of people involved in that over the years, uh, book design mostly in-house. And that's pretty much where it's been uh, since then. But as I said, Regardi was the major motivating factor back in 1979-80. Hyatt had just retired from being a shrink. In fact, he wasn't even known as Hyatt in those days. It was Alan Miller. He didn't take on the name Hyatt until, oh, a couple of years into Falcon's existence. But Alan had been a, uh, a psychologist, marriage and family counselor in, in uh, California, which is where we met around 1971. Well, again, my arithmetic says that's 50 years ago. That's spooky. Every time I look in the mirror, it's spooky. <laughs> I, I keep forgetting how many years have actually gone by. <laughs> However, so uh, Regardi and, and Alan were pretty much at that point not doing a whole lot. Regardi had pretty much uh, retired from his chiropractic and writing and therapy practice. Alan had retired from his practice, uh, had been getting into some other things, but found that retirement really didn't suit him all that well. I mean, he had a wonderful time traveling around, went to Europe, met some interesting, really interesting people, but he was not real satisfied with just traveling or doing nothing. So this was a great opportunity, and that brought in the second reason for Falcon Press, and that was what we called then a retirement press. We figured with the Regardi titles that we had, the Crowley titles that we had, and now Alan could start writing some things of his own too, maybe we'd pick up somebody else who knows, doesn't matter, but you know, we'd bring in enough dollars forever because Regardi's titles from 50 years ago are still selling, from 70 years ago are still selling. Crowley's titles from 100 years ago are still selling. And that's the sort of thing we wanted to produce. It would have essentially a guaranteed <laughs> retirement income. And it's kind of worked out that way in a, in a fashion, but also lots of other twists and turns that have happened. Mm -hmm. I'd say probably the biggest twist was uh, getting Robert Anton Wilson uh, into our line. That was about 1985. And Regardi was responsible for bringing Wilson in to Falcon. Uh, Bob, at that point, had a brand new book called Prometheus Rising. Mm -hmm. He had tried to shop it to uh, other publishers, particularly one who turned him down. And he brought it to us because of Regardi. And about 37 and a half minutes, we said, sure. And we were off and running, had a contract drawn, and then that other publisher, interestingly enough, a very, very short time later came back and said, we've reconsidered, we'll do that. And Bob said, well, no, because <laughs> we had a contract or something. And we ended up eventually doing about 19 of his books, which was quite something. And, of course, Bob is a great writer. We never edited anything that uh, he provided to us. Uh, we would do at most just a quick spell check sort of thing on it uh, because he was just that good a writer. There was no point in making any changes to it. Uh, what he had to say is his stuff. Uh, now, that's not the case with a lot of authors, to be sure. A lot of them need help, but Bob was not one of those. Through Bob, we ended up with Tim Leary as well. And sadly, of course, both of them are gone, no longer in the world. But uh, on top of that, we no longer produce any of their titles. Uh, Bob's titles, as you probably are aware, are all being done by his daughter now, Christine. And she's uh, been producing several of his titles, not all of them out yet, but I expect she'll get that in time. And uh, the lyric titles, I think, are with New Falcon Publications, or at least some of them are. And you know, I feel bad about that. I uh, would like to have had the lyric titles in the line, even though they never sold very well. It doesn't matter. Uh, we were never 
that much uh, possessed by the income that we could get from the books, uh, retirement notwithstanding. So if it sold a few copies, that was fine. And we had the wonderful opportunity, as, as we did, to meet Tim. That also is an interesting story to tell one of these days. A lot of weird synchronicities, Indra's net all over the place. Uh, maybe we can get to that at some point, too. Mm. And uh, a lot of other authors came to us over time, too. And we were kind of surprised at that. We eventually ended up making a name for ourselves as a medium-sized niche pro publisher, and we are. Uh, we used to get, back in the old days, something like uh, 100 to 200 submissions a month. And you would imagine it would take a little time to go through them. No, actually not. It's amazing how quickly you could go through submissions uh, when they're, well, if you look at the, at the spate of books that are out there right now in the world, most of them are crap. And those are the ones that got published. <laughs> the ones that didn't get published are even crappier still. I mean, I'm thinking, for example, of one from some years ago, The Celestine Prophecy is a title you may have heard of, you may have even seen the book, you may have even read the book, God help you. I heard of it. I remember reading the first five pages or so of it after it had been out, picked up by another uh, publisher so on. And I looked at it and said, this book is absolute garbage. And yet it turned into a whole phenomenon, a whole thing. Um, anybody who tells you that an expert in the field, like supposedly that's what I am, is an expert, you know, after 40 years, you supposedly can take on that mantle, even if you don't know Shinola. <laughs> and that's pretty much what I have to say. You know, I'm, I'm <laughs> as a Buddhist myself, <laughs> I cannot say I'm an expert on anything. I'm not. But some people think that that means that the books that are published by experts are better than the ones that aren't. Actually not. And you can see this throughout the entertainment business. It has nothing to do with the occult business. It has nothing to do with mysticism or the kinds of things that you and I would be involved with. Uh, it, it has to do with the fact that most of it is garbage and the people who are making these choices um, have absolutely no idea what they're doing. Take a look at the entertainment business, like movies, for example. One movie studio, if it has three really good hits in a year, is turning money hand over fist. They're just having a wonderful time. They're set for the next year. But if they had two good movies, they're at the edge of bankruptcy. And that's kind of where it is oftentimes. Book publishers, same thing, not quite as bad. You look at people in other parts of the entertainment business, like sports, which most people I don't think think of as entertainment, but that's what it is. Uh, singers, all these things. Uh, most of it is a combination of circumstance and what we tend to call luck. But uh, I suppose from the Buddhist point of view, it's all quite funny. And it really is. What works, what doesn't work, has very little to do with quality. It has very little to do with the things called hard work and effort and talent. Some of those things come into play in peripheral ways, but it's, to me, sort of analogous to what some of the chaos magicians think of, of magic or how they think of magic. Uh, if you were to ask Phil Hine, for example, or Pete Carroll, or many of the other chaos magicians, how effective is chaos magic? You might find an answer like this. Um, it might have an effect of 1% on the world. I've had people who have asked me, well, what sort of magical rituals should I do to get a job, to get a better job? And I said, well, here are some of the magical ri rituals you can do. Go out and buy better clothes. Learn to speak well. Be friendly. Uh, make sure you take a bath. 
Those are the magical rituals that will help you get a job. Learn about the company that you're applying to. Learn about the people you're going to be interviewing with. And they look at me and ask, but, but uh, should I draw a pentagram? And should it be counterclockwise or clockwise that I draw it? I mean, I know the planets will just blow up if I draw it wrong. In fact, the universe could come to an end, but I'm just trying to get a job. Well, make sure you dress well. That's the 99%. Maybe the ritual, the getting a job ritual, might have an effect of a small amount. But those are the things that we tend, tend to pay a lot of attention to. I think you know what I'm talking about here. The inner work that we tend to want to do. People like yourself want to do it. I want to do it. But there's a lot of people, particularly in, in the mystical areas, that don't. They think of everything as being strictly on the outside, not the inside. Mm. And I don't find, unfortunately, those people to be very effective in life. Mm. Nor do they seem to be very lucky. Most of them seem to have very unpleasant lives, I'm sorry to say. Nice people oftentimes. Uh, I think they're focused on the wrong part of the bell-shaped curve. Yeah, I think sometimes, I don't know, I guess like a a vague metric I kind of developed was like, I don't know, 95% of people will never really be so interested in in change. They won't be sufficiently interested in it to really challenge themselves. You know, they will just go through watching the news and you know, getting their job and their partner and whatever and just go through like that and probably at some point maybe something bad happens out of the blue and uh, and their life gets in a mess, you know, and then maybe maybe there's like 1% or half a percent of people who will be super motivated just to create change and pretty much nothing is going to stop them. They're just coming out of wherever they came out of, their background, and they're going to move forwards and, and, and get it together. And then somewhere in between there's like, I don't know, three or four percent of people who, I mean, it's kind of like a like a like a planet orbiting the sun, you know, like you have this thing, centrifugal force or something, you know, if it if it goes fast enough, it can kind of leave the sun, and the sun is like the culture that we're kind of born in, and they're kind of like, you know, they've got enough speed to see that they want to they want something different, you know, and they're not happy in the culture, but they haven't got enough kind of speed and energy up to really leave the culture. And they're the kind of guys that come to therapy groups a bit, you know, it's one way of seeing it, it's one way of seeing it. It's a little bit how I see it, but I mean, yeah, the masses will, I don't know if it's endemic to the human condition or some bugs in our evolutionary kind of wiring, but most people will, will just go for comfort. You know I mean? If something's comfortable, they'll go for it and they go for distraction and, like the guys you're talking about just now, that they, they go for a quick fix. You know, we all want a quick fix. We don't really want to have to engage with with something. That's uh, you know, that's kind of how I see society. And I don't know if that will ever change. I always used to kind of, you know, I had awakening kind of experiences back in my 30s, and you know, then eventually I got involved in meditation and therapy and stuff like that. And I always thought, wouldn't it be awesome if, like, masses of people could just wake up and change the world? But increasingly, I kind of wonder if that's really likely to happen. And, and, and increasingly, I think it probably isn't. I don't know. I mean, do you ever think about stuff like that at all, uh, Nick? Oftentimes. One, one of the things that uh, struck me, well, there's two things I think worth worth noting here. One is just a quick note that... Sometimes it's been attributed to Rajneesh, sometimes to Gajit, that they said publicly to their followers, 95% of you are food. 5% of you will get something out of this, but the rest of you are food. And I'm not sure that either one of the two actually ever said that, but it's certainly attributed to them and certainly quite appropriate. The only thing I would say in response to that, however, is that I think both of them were optimists. 
five percent is way too high. Yeah. You were talking one or two percent a little earlier. And I, I think that's closer to reality. But the other thing that I wanted to say about this was an observation that I made many years ago. As you know, I grew up during the 1960s, and certainly there was a lot of interesting stuff going on during that time. Uh, I graduated from my undergraduate work in 1967, for example. So I saw a lot of college stuff starting. And then when I left and went to graduate school, saw even more stuff happening. And what was the stuff? Well, it was all over the place kinds of stuff, whether it was people who were advocating for this or advocating for that, sex, drugs, rock and roll, uh, fairness and justice, anti-war, pro-war, there was a lot of stuff going on and people were involved and excited, so it seemed. And then you go into the 1970s and see even more of that. But by the time the 70s were winding down, all of a sudden those people weren't there anymore. And the question that I had is, where did they go? Were they picked up by aliens? What happened to them? These people who had ideas, who were involved with freedom in some fashion, with experimentation, all just disappeared with the exception of a few. People like Bob Wilson, people like Christopher Hyatt, people like Tim Leary, and certainly a bunch of others. But the numbers were tiny compared to what it had been in the 60s and 70s. And it took me a long time. I'd come back to that question over and over again. Where did they go? What happened to them? And what happened to them is they found something new. They were never terribly interested in the things that they were pursuing and advocating. That was just a thing to do, a way to pass the time, a way to fit in with other people, a way to be accepted by the tribe. And we have the same thing going on today. It hasn't changed any. Only the content has changed. Only the people that they're trying to get approval from have changed. And you know, those people tend to be folks who are willing to put themselves on the line, take risks, and advocate for weirdness until they get into power, of course, and then they try to suppress it all. And you can see all of that going on today, too. But most of the people who are their followers, if you will, aren't following. They're just you know, hanging up until the next new thing comes along. And then they'll be doing that. You know, how much good or evil they'll do in the process is another story. But that is the human condition. Mm -hmm. I hope that gave you a sense of where my head's been with this. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I I I, I hear you. You know, uh, yeah, it's kind of a, a sobering thought, I guess. I mean, it's a little bit well, off. One of the things worth noting here too is that Hyatt, for most of his life, saw the human condition for what it was. I mean, this is why he went into being a psychologist. He was good at it as a kid. And as time went on, he became better and better at it until you know, by the time I met him in 1971, at which point he was like uh, 28 years old or so, uh, he already could get a, a good feel for somebody within seconds of meeting them. And I've seen that a zillion times. But his view on the human species was, shall we say, rather dark. He saw the human species as being a dead end. And he and I, during those earlier years, had a lot to say with each other about it. I was of the opinion that the human species was just lacking, like, rationality. That's all we needed was a little touch of rationality now and again. We'd be fine. Maybe an education or two would be good. And as time went on, years went on, I came round to his way of thinking that the human species really is doomed. 
And I have to say, one of the great sadnesses of my life is that here, today, now, as we watch the world crumbling about us, Hyatt's not here to see it. He would have loved to see this stuff. He wanted to see it. He wanted to help it along. And he made no bones about it. In many of his books, he was clear. Let's see if we can help destroy the world. The Psychopath Bible is a wonderful example of that. Mm. You know, make a good life for yourself. Have a good time. Enjoy yourself. Find some freedom of your own and destroy the world in the process. He would have loved it. He just died too many years too soon. But I'm enjoying watching it. I've even come to a point where I watch news programs from time to time just to see how crazy it all is. Mm. And boy, it doesn't take but a few seconds oftentimes to get the gist of just how insane this world is. I think they can bring witch burning back. What do you think? Mm. <laughs> I mean, it wouldn't surprise me. If it came back suddenly, you know, I mean, nothing much, I don't know, maybe something would surprise me these days. Do you, do you, do you miss Dr. Hyatt? You talk, you talk about him quite a lot so far. You, you guys were close. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, not only did we work together, certainly, but I met him originally as his patient. I was introduced to him by a mutual friend, Jack Willis. Again, there's an interesting story behind that one, too. And that was in 71. And uh, then I started doing Reiki therapy with Alan and did for several years. Uh, but in those days, the relationship between therapists and patients was often quite different than it is these days. Uh, Alan had no problem in doing business relationships with his patients, uh, socializing with them. Uh, that was normal stuff. These days, it would get you defrocked, mm. literally thrown out of the profession if you mm. did any of those things. They have magic words to describe it, dual relationships and such. But uh, so we got to be friendly. We uh, would go to lunch once a week. Uh, we would get together professionally or personally in a whole lot of ways. And we also spent a lot of time on his sailboat. That's one of the things he loved to do was sail. And I had a lot of background on powerboats growing up, but really very little in sailboats. So he taught me essentially to sail. And uh, we did a lot of, lot of that together. And then uh, separately as well, as after I got uh, my first boats, uh, did some sailing from the West Coast of the U.S. to uh, Hawaii. Those were interesting experiences as well. And in fact, one of those trips was uh, Hyatt, myself, and uh, S. Jason Black. Or, uh, he, he was, well, our, the cabin boy on that trip. Uh, so that was a great, great trip in itself. And there's, again, some really wild stories, some of which we published and talked about in other places. But uh, things like the golden man who showed up in the middle of the night um, we found out that someone we knew had died and was literally, his, his uh, body was being flown over us to Hawaii as this golden man appeared on the boat. Go figure that one out. I got nothing to say on it. Uh, the time, time on that same trip where we got hit by a telephone pole in the middle of the ocean. We're 700 miles or so out of Hawaii and a telephone pole hits us right on the bow. We thought we were done. But it turned out after we got to Hawaii and pulled the boat out of the water, it was a little scratch. That was it. But what kind of message would you say would be coming from a telephone pole? Hmm. Always wondered about that. And David Wilson, or S. Jason Black, as he's known uh, in, in his writings, uh, he was doing a lot of divination. That was a lot of fun. Uh, oftentimes quite wrong, by the way. <laughs> if we had followed his divinations, we would have ended up in the middle of a storm. But he was enjoying doing his tarot, and uh, he had plum bobs that were waving back and forth, and rat skulls, pretty startling. 
He had a lot of good stuff on, on the boat. Uh, then there was the alcohol. Well, we'll talk about that another time. <laughs> yeah. That was a great trip, and uh, that was on Alan's boat, not on uh, on one of mine. And uh, then we spent some some serious time in Hawaii. I lived there for a few years uh, before that, and really enjoyed it tremendously. It's probably my favorite place to be, and uh, where I am now in Arizona is probably my second. I think a lot of it has to do with it not cold. <laughs> Like not cold. Yeah. You live in cold. Cold is interesting stuff, you know. Cold is interesting stuff. I don't like sleeping. I don't like to be cold when I sleep. But I've been I've been like last winter here in the UK, you know, it's quite cold in the sea. I mean there's a little bit of Gulf Stream, but maybe in, in, in Fahrenheit it's like forty degrees or something. And it's pretty cool to get in the water, you know, and do 15, 20 minutes swimming in the water. And it does weird shit to you, you know. It's like uh, it kind of regenerates some part of your your system. You get these strange, like you're talking a bit about about Reiki and therapy, you know. And I actually learned to kind of breathe much better. And I didn't really learn it actually, but it just seemed to happen as some kind of response to being in cold water, you know. Like some earlier part of my brain kicked in, and my, I I started to just breathe from my belly in this quite intense primal way it's like you know it's interesting stuff the cold yeah i grew up in cold areas mm -hmm. uh the northern more northern part of the united states and uh decided many many years ago that i'd had enough of it <laughs> living in uh in the north in the cold and the wind the roaring <laughs> wind coming off the lakes and the oceans uh moved to california that was january of 1971 interestingly enough 10 days later right after i arrived 10 days more uh major league earthquake hit so that was a hell of an introduction to california woke me up at six o'clock in the morning that was fun wow i did through a few earthquakes including one that I felt, I don't know, it's about 10 years ago, I was here in Arizona and felt an earthquake in California, of all things. That was a weird one. But I keep hoping California will fall into the ocean one day. People mm -hmm. keep telling me that geologically that doesn't work. <laughs> but Lex Luthor thought it might work. <laughs> <laughs> and Lex Luthor's a lot smarter than I am. I mean, a lot of stuff is going down these days in the world, hey? It's like things are coming to a head a bit, you know? That's my sense of it. I don't know. I mean, who knows what who, who, who knows what will happen next? I don't know. I don't know. I'm intrigued, you know, because I just first got in touch with you when I ordered this book of Israel Regardis about... I was trying to learn more Reiki and therapy techniques, and rather like bioenergetics, it's kind of difficult because... No one really wrote much down. I mean, Alexander Lowen wrote a lot of books, but he didn't really focus so much on the real, actual physical techniques so much. And so that was challenging. And then when I started to look at Reich, I thought, God, it's, it's, it's just the same. You know? So I was checking out a few different authors, and I was aware of Jack Willis's book. But uh, what was I going to say? When I first got in, so when I first got in touch, what, I, what surprised me was that I didn't had no idea there was a, such a correlation or, or a connection between kind of the Western mystery tradition, you know, the esoteric side and and you know Reiki and therapy. And uh, because I myself back in the late nineties when I started to get interested in alternative stuff, I was a member of a, a Kabbalah group based in Los Angeles, actually the builders of the Adatum. And for a few years and doing their coursework, you know, and then I moved on to just I got in the Osho scene, which Osho was already dead for like a decade then. But there was a lot of therapy around that scene. I got into that and I dropped the whole esoteric thing and, and slowly worked my way through that and got more into the Reiki and, and, and the body based kind of stuff. But I was surprised when I found this book, New Wings for Daedalus, but it was by Israel Regardi because I remembered him from. The, the, the esoteric stuff, well, he wasn't involved with the Builders of the Adatum, he was like the Golden Dawn and stuff like this. So I was going to ask you about that, what, 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 
where how far back the connection goes or, or what do you know about that stuff? Well, Reich himself would probably be terribly offended if you were to suggest that there was anything mystical about his work. Mm -hmm. The fact that a lot of people who had mystical leanings picked up on his work, uh, well, that was one of the many reasons, no doubt, that he kept it secret. He had the notion that only full-blown medical doctors could practice his therapy work. He, of course, himself was an MD, worked with uh, Freud and Jung back in the, <laughs> back in the day. But uh, he had the notion that only MDs trained by him and his people could learn these techniques. And so that's one of the simple reasons why he never published any of these things. Well, Rigardi was trained in the techniques by a guy who was trained by a guy who was trained by Reich. Mm -hmm. One of those guys, I believe, was named Kirk Arudo or had a name similar. I've never been able to dig him up, figure out who he was. Mm -hmm. And the other guy's name I forgot entirely. But you know, this is where Rigardi picked it up. And of course, Rigardi himself had been in mystical areas forever and ever back in the days before he met uh, Alistair Crowley and when, when they were involved with each other. Uh, Gordy, of course, practiced his uh, Reichian work primarily under his chiropractic license. He got a chiropractic uh, degree so that he could have the bona fides to do these kinds of things. But he still would not have been accepted by Reich and Reich's people. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, when we started Falcon about 71, or 79 rather, uh, the Reichian group was still around. As far as I know, they disappeared entirely. They used to have an operation in, in the state of Maine in the U.S., and uh, I haven't seen or heard anything about them in a very long time. We did have some contact with them about the late 80s when we were bringing out one of Bob Wilson's book called Wilhelm Reich and Hell. It's actually a play that Bob wrote and some commentary. And uh, I think it was Alan had written the, the intro to it, Hyatt did, and it discussed in part that before the book was even out, before we'd hardly announced it, we get an inquiry from the Reichian people in Maine asking to see a copy of the book if they were concerned maybe perhaps we were saying some things we shouldn't say or that they would be unhappy with. Mm -hmm. We never heard further back. But their paranoia inflamed our paranoia. And as I used to like to say a lot, paranoia will destroy you. Mm -hmm. That's what we saw with a lot of the Reichian stuff. Well, Rigardi taught Hyatt. Rigardi also taught Jack Willis. Mm -hmm. Jack was um, a bit rigid. Loved Jack dearly, I have to say. Knew Jack before I knew Al. But he was terribly rigid. Brilliant, but rigid. And so a lot of the things that Rigardi taught him, he never really got the flavor of. He only got the do this, do that, do this, do that kind of technique. Whereas mm. Alan, very organic. Mm. Whatever was needed at the moment, he could intuit, he could see, he could feel, he could justify it all. He had the data behind him. But that's not how his brain operated. Which was interesting, you know, with the two of us, because I tend to be more analytical, he tended to be more deductive. Mm -hmm. uh, or inductive, I should say. Uh, so that's where that background comes from. New Wings for Daedalus is a book that Regardi wrote just around the time of Reich's death. It was written in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. And never published. We have the original manuscript, of course. And it was one of those things we intended to do 
long time ago, maybe yes, maybe no. We never quite decided whether we really wanted to release some of this material or not. And a couple of years ago, I decided, well, uh, it's now or never. Mm -hmm. that, that book would just die. And it was, it was a real labor of love. It's not a great seller, never will be, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But uh, you can imagine what it must have been like for us to have to literally scan all of these original typewritten pages, oftentimes with handwritten notes on them, mm -hmm. and everything faded and <laughs> broken up, and lots of rewrites, and then try to make a book out of it, and plus get some, some people who were contemporaries to write some things for the book. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it had me pulling my hair out, and I can hardly afford losing much more of that. <laughs> but it, it, we're very pleased. I mean, the book came out great. Mm -hmm. And for right now, at least, uh, if people want to get it, they should go to our website because it's not available most other places yet. It may change in, in times, but for right now, it's only available through us directly. Most of our books are, of course, available through lots of other sources, but not that one right now. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I have a feeling like somewhere, I don't know, there'll be a bit of a Reikian revival in the next years. I don't know. I mean, who knows of these things, you know, but that's a little bit the sense I had, but it never really, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if things would have been different if Reich hadn't got so kind of busy with his orgone therapy or orgone theory and stuff like that, if he, if he could have... I don't know. I don't have much sense of the guy. I never wrote, read Myron Sharaf's book. He wrote an autobiography, a biography of Reich, I think. But uh, I don't know. It seemed kind of a shame that someone coming out of this kind of mainstream background associated with Freud, developing some incredible theories, you know, in character analysis. And then it all kind of just dissipated away somehow. Or it seems to have just have been, uh, to have been, what's the word? shoved to one side, you know, and uh, on account uh, of all the controversy he got involved in with his with his orgone therapy, you know, and I mean, so I don't really know what happened at all, but and some people write it up as a big conspiracy, the FDA were after him or whatever, I don't know. But uh, it does seem kind of a shame, and yet this body of knowledge, uh, you know, with character structure, with armoring, segmental armoring, this kind of thing, you know, it, was, it, it comprised a big element of, I think, Osho, Rajneesh's work, really, you know, particularly the more interesting bits of it and dynamic meditation and stuff. And also Gurdjieff, you know, it's like it's like somewhere this, uh, there is a bit of a channel of it being broadcast to earth somehow, not that I super believe in these things. And, you know, it hasn't really gone away completely. It gets pushed into the background, but it kind of resurges a little bit. I was intrigued. Well, that we will see a resurgence of it in, well, anytime soon now. Uh, and this, this, to me, a simple <laughs> and bizarre reason for that. Most of the people who were involved in the body center therapies, whether it's Reikian or uh, bioenergetics, by the way, you know, you're probably aware, bioenergetics was developed by Alexander Lowen because he split from Reich over the orgone stuff. Mm. You know, that was getting to be a bit much, at least that's what the bioenergetics people would tell you. Uh, they, they just couldn't handle, or Lowen couldn't handle uh, the bioenergetics or the uh, orgone stuff, and said, okay, I'm out of here, well, let's keep, let's keep the, the psychotherapy part. Mm. So they're the only people right now, as best as I can tell, who are probably still maintaining those techniques back to the original Reikian work. Uh, there's a lot of other things that people consider offshoots of that uh, other body-centered stuff, whether it's uh, Primal Scream, which I haven't even heard of in years, or Rolfing, or a bunch of other things that I don't even see having that lineage, but you know, they're body-centered. But hardly any of that is around anymore, and there's a reason for it. It goes back to something I was alluding to earlier, that the rules of being a shrink have changed a lot. Mm -hmm. And 
All you need to do if you want to practice some of those things, if you're a licensed therapist in whatever facility, whether it's psychiatrist, psychologist, marriage and family counselor, pick something. If you've got a license, just imagine the day will come when you'll be before that licensing board and they'll ask you, okay, um, doctor, tell me, so what's a typical session like? Well, a uh, patient comes in and takes his clothes off and lays down and I manipulate their body and have them do things. And we, I'm touching and touching, lots of touching. And in fact, we're trying to generate orgastic responses here. And you can imagine that it would be three, maybe even four seconds before your license is torn up right in front of you. <laughs> if you don't end up in jail. Yeah. Which is That's why some of the practitioners these days don't get licenses. Which is you know, one of the things that people ask me from time to time is, what, what was all the stuff that Hyatt had with mystical stuff going on, analogous to what you were saying earlier. He's doing this Reikian stuff, and he's doing this mystical stuff, and they're all kind of put together. Mm. Well, Alan never made any bones about it, at least to people like uh, myself who were working with him directly. And that is that the mystical stuff was just cover. It was, he still maintained his license for a lot of years, for reasons that we won't get into. Mm. But he wanted to maintain the license, but still be able to do the work. And so he would do the work under the mystical aura, if you will, chakra therapy, or whatever mm. words he'd pull out of his ear on that particular day to cover. So anybody who reads his work and sees the mystical stuff, uh, along with the Riken stuff, forget the mystical stuff. Alan wasn't buying it either. Mm. Alan saw all the mystical stuff that he was involved with as more psychological than external, much as we were talking about with Chaos Magic earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not that much that you can really do to affect the world by calling on demons and doing sacrifices and things along those lines. Mm -hmm. uh, or at least that's my position on it. And I tend to think uh, a lot of people uh, who are in the field that we're talking about here, of body-centered therapies and psychotherapies, would see it that way too. That's not to say that you can't be a mystic also, and Alan was, mm -hmm. as was regarding but they're also very, oh, I hate to use this word, but I will, pulled something out from the old days. Centered! He was centered! Grounded! Mm. Grounded. That sounds electrical to me. Hmm. Short circuit? Ah. Well, the, <laughs> the process has had a lot of twists and turns. But these days, I don't know that you're going to find too many people doing this kind of work anymore, which is why we were so happy in the early part of this century that we had the tools to finally show people in video. Uh, we had tried back in the 90s to do some video stuff, but it was just not really there. We didn't have the, the means to produce it very effectively, and certainly didn't have the means to distribute it very effectively. Mm -hmm. But once DVDs came along, and now MP4 uh, for downloads, streaming and such, uh, it became possible to do it. So a lot of the books and a lot of the audios are wonderful supplemental material, but the thing that really matters is the radical one doing uh, videos and the energized hypnosis videos. That's where you can see what you're actually doing. One of the things, though, that people ask me from time to time is, are there any practitioners around that I can work with? And my answer is, I don't know of any. None that we'd recommend anyway. The closest I can get to a recommendation is, go check out the, the bioenergetics people. They have at least better prospects, as best as I can tell. 
but I haven't looked at them closely either, so I can't really say. Maybe you know them better. Well, I don't know. I mean, I don't know in the States so much. I mean, there's a little bit in Spain and Italy and Europe with bioenergetics and Germany, but a lot of them are kind of old now. I mean, not that I'm young, but, you know, I don't think it's that, that there's not much of a scene and some of it would I, but I saw was a bit more radical and really getting in there maybe 10, 20 years ago, then kind of new aged out a little bit and became a bit more kind of dancey, you know, this kind of dilution of stuff and certainly in Europe there's been a huge rise of called kind of alternative therapy and dance stuff and there's there's nothing wrong with it and, and everything being called tantra under the sun but there is a huge lack of really okay let's really get in there kind of therapy you know encounter therapy or these kind of deep near reiki and techniques working with the body and really getting in there and there and there are people who are interested absolutely you know, there's there's a lot of people who are interested about two or three years ago. I mean, there's a famous guy in the States who was a bodybuilder originally, and he had a huge YouTube channel. His name is um, Elliot Hulse. He's in South Florida. And, you know, he was followed by literally millions of young guys in America and, 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 and all over the West and Arab countries. And he invited me to a, an event he was doing in London. And I saw like, you know, like a hundred young guys came along to this thing and you know, Elliot's a pretty cool guy and a great kind of figurehead, but he, you know, he's not trained as a therapist, so they weren't doing any kind of intense process work. But what struck me was like, there is a market, you know, there are a lot of, a lot of people out there who, who want change, you know, they want, they, 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 they want to be led in a process that can actually, you know, really move something that's got, that is confrontational. It's not just working with the mind, and so I see there are people who are up for it, you know. I mean, a lot will go to ayahuasca and to South America and stuff like that. But there's also people who really want this kind of body-based stuff and this sense of, okay, I'm really getting confronted here. I'm really getting into my stuff. You know, when I first did encounter therapy with Osho people, you know, there was a sense of, okay, this is hell, but it is real. This, is, this does go on inside of me. These are people, people's judgments about me, you know, and there's a sense of, now I really faced myself and and I think prior to that, you know, I'd never really had that sense. And and I kind of feel with a lot of people, they li live a bit in the same in, in, in the same kind of domain. And yet at the same time, it's constantly challenging to deliver therapeutic process like this, because, as you say, you know, standards change. You know, the idea of making physical contact is uh, is, is increasingly not OK. Uh, and so it's. Hey. To, to me, it's just a challenge. You know, it's a challenge to continue delivering work like this, but to, but to start to, you know, remove elements which are which are seen as as not okay. Like you mentioned about Jack Willis, you know, and the rigidity. I mean, a lot of therapists, great therapists that I I worked with when I was doing therapy, they were rigid, man. They were rigid as fuck, you know. I mean, and in their attitude, and it's like, no, you have to do it this way, and that's the only way you can do it, and. I can be quite rigid as a character type and physically in my body, but I, I, I thought, no, not necessarily. Maybe we can, you know, alter things around, even in lockdown, you know, still look what can be done, you know, what can be done if you really try. You know, so that's well, been One of the things that seems really to me worth noting, though, is that you, I, I think you're right. That there's a lot of therapists, particularly, that are rigid and what that means to me is they're not, really not very good at what they do. They don't have the wherewithal to be fluid. But you know, take, for example, Fritz Perls. He was very fluid, apparently. Everything I learned about him, everything I read about him, he developed an entire system, to be sure. But it was a very fluid, dynamic system. The people who came after him, who used his system, were very dogmatic about it. it has to be done this way it has to be done that way you mm -hmm. see the same thing with uh neuro linguistic programming nlp uh of course that came out of ericksonian hypnosis which uh most people are aware of but when bandler and grinder got hold of it it was uh very very useful for a lot of people at the beginning but the deeper into it you got, the more rigid it became. Hmm. 
uh, one of my friends, Steve Heller, who did uh, one of the books that we published for many years, Monsters and Magical Sticks. Great book. He was an Ericksonian hypnotist himself. Uh, not particularly NLP, but he certainly knew NLP and the people involved quite well. One of his fellow therapists once came to him and said, Steve, I'm going nuts. I've been doing this NLP stuff. And initially, I had gone to like their weekend seminar and took the material back to my office. And it was really effective. And it was so great that I decided I was going to take their one week class. And so I did that. And then I liked that so much, I took their two-week class or their 12-year class, whatever the next one in the progression was. And I noticed that more and more, my practice was falling apart. I kept trying to get this tiny little bit exactly right. Mm. This phrase, that word, that touch, it had to be exactly right. And my imagination, my natural qualities have all gone to hell. And Steve said, you're right. Anyone who goes to more than their week, free weekend seminar is going to find themselves in exactly that position. And that's what you see with so many of these systems. There's another thing that's changed, too, that uh, is worth noting. And that's psychiatry. Psychiatrists don't do therapy anymore. I don't know about Europe, but I can say in this country, they do one thing and one thing only. They push pills. That's it. Mm. They write scripts, push pills. Mm. Oh, and maybe they go into a courtroom and be an expert witness now and again. Mm. But they don't do therapy. In fact, any, any psychiatrist who wants to do therapy will find it very difficult because just getting into a school, just into a class that offers that kind of stuff is very difficult to do from that point of view. Psychologists are pretty much a dying breed, but they're the only ones that actually do therapy now. And of course, it's all just talk therapy, the same stuff that it's been for many years. And the body-centered stuff is left primarily to the non-official practitioners. People who aren't psychologists, people who aren't psychiatrists. Mm. But I have to say, if there's going to be any resurgence in any of these things, I'm not sure where it's going to come from, but it's pretty sure it ain't going to come from those directions. But mm. the wonderful thing about life is you push over here and it pops out over there. Mm. So sooner or later, we could see some changes and maybe you'll be part of that. Mm. We try to be part of it as much as we can. Yeah, man. I mean, we all, I don't know, I guess intuitively we sometimes do stuff, you know, and we don't really know, you know, I, I, I've been writing books. I wrote a book on bioenergetics and I'm writing, in fact, I'm now going to write four books titled Bioenergetics, which is a little bit loose because two of them certainly will be a lot about Reiki and stuff, but what I've learned, but, you know, you don't know where somewhere down the line there could be some emergence of something useful, you know, you're just like, I don't know, I'm just working away, I'm doing my little bit of the puzzle. And, uh, you know, as I intuitively are led and, and I don't know, you know, it's kind of funny, uh, the world like that, you don't really know what, what, you know, we have this very logical way of thinking and linear way of thinking. And yet in reality, a lot of stuff just seems to spontaneously emerge from multiple complex sources or lower order processes or whatever, you know, and, and, uh, you know, that's kind of how it is. That's kind of how it is. And I like that. I mean, also what you were saying, you know, I mean, there is rigidity, but I mean, it's also the case that rigidity is also useful. It's just kind of knowing when you need it and when not, I guess, you know, there are people who just want to follow the rules. And sometimes that's really appropriate. You know, some people are trying to wiggle out of a process, especially with deep psychological work. You know, it needs holding, you know, you need accountability. And, you know, when you look at spiritual things, I guess, as well, you know, it, it, I guess, like with Osho, you know, he died about 30 years ago. And I think, I don't know if he picked just the most rigid people. Oh, 1990, oh, I think it was, I, yes. I, I, yeah. But I think he picked, like, the most rigid people to continue things because 
you know, you, you kind of want your things to continue in a certain way. So if you just pick the most hippie, fluid hippies, I mean, of course, they're just going to mess around with it all, you know. So you have to pick the most, the, you know, the most rigid people you can find who are absolutely going to refuse to change it from how the master said it should be. And that's had certain repercussions in the Osho scene with a lot of trademark stuff and fights and people who are supposed to be very, very enlightened, not behaving in a very enlightened way. But, um, you know, it's all part of it, I guess. But uh, say, of, of all the groups that I've known and been involved with, I, I must say that the Rajneeshis were the best that I've ever run across. Mm. Uh, it might have gotten to the 5% level. Mm. Uh, whereas, oh, Crowley's groups, for example, uh, I, I'm hard pressed to find 1%. Mm. But the Rajneeshis are definitely decent people fun-loving people, enjoying, enjoyable people who were doing interesting things even after he died. There mm. were a number of them that were doing some good stuff. Some of them crazy as a loon, no mm. question about it. Absolutely. Uh, uh, I spent some time at the, uh, the ranch, as they called it, uh, in Oregon uh, mm. some years before he died and had a great time and a marvelous time. But uh, he, of course, eventually was thrown out of the country and couldn't find another place to land except India. And that didn't last for very long before he died. He was a fairly young man when he died, too. He was, what, I think 53 or thereabouts. Yeah, yeah, maybe so a little bit. From what I understand. But he was brilliant, actually brilliant. And one of the things that I always found interesting is that he, he too, made no bones about it. He said, any word that I utter right now, as soon as I've uttered it, it's dead. Mm. And all the people around him are dutifully taking down every word he says. Mm. All of his dead words. And then they published them. We even published one of his books. We were delighted to. We just wanted a picture of him. We, we actually went to one of the, the uh, uh, book conventions one year and found the Rajneeshis were there and that guy's before he even called himself Osho. And we ended up publishing one of his books and uh, we were absolutely delighted to do that. But Phil, Osho himself would say, why are you publishing this stuff? I imagine. I would imagine he said, but you know, this is all dead words. Mm. Well, he certainly used to like, he'd give one discourse, you know, and then the everyone would take that in and, okay, this is the way it is. And then the next day he'd give another discourse, which would utterly contradict it, you know. So this would... Sometimes, sometimes uh, he used to say deliberately that he absolutely. was doing it. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, I never met Osho and I was never around the scene at that time. But another thing that intrigued me was that, I don't know, I can't remember the name so much, but... At the time when he became powerful and well-known back in the 70s, you know, in Bombay and Mumbai and then Pune, uh, you know, there was a big scene, as you said, you know, of alternatives going on and people preaching all sorts of alternative religions and philosophies and ways of changing stuff. And then along came this guy who actually started to do it, you know, and and then it was like, OK, are people going to are they going to go there and see what it's about or are they going to kind of stay with their preaching and their talking, you know, and I've heard from people that a lot of people were really, you know, kind of churned up because they've been preaching a lot of radical revolution, free love stuff. And now here was someone kind of doing it and, you know, creating a very challenging environment to be in, you know, in the ashram. And so it's been like, OK, are you going to keep preaching it or are you going to you, you actually going to go there and, and see what the fuck's going on? You know, I like to think if it had been me, I would have gone. But I don't know. I usually only I guess I only usually only do stuff when when there's a crisis, then I will really move my ass. And otherwise I can be a bit lazy. But I, I found that intriguing as well, you know, and I kind of. I don't know. I mean, it would be so great to have some other kind of real full-blown mystic just land on it. Osho gets a lot of shit these days, you know, but it would be so great to have some real full-blown mystic, you know, not a kind of quiet, introspective one, 
but just a real out there one again, just rocking up and going for it, you know, but I don't know if that'll happen or maybe it, it is and I never heard about it, but that would be kind of cool, you know, I don't know. You have any thoughts yeah. about stuff like that? I don't see any of that on the horizon either, but then I have to say I'm, I, I kind of stopped looking. Mm. Uh, there's so much garbage out there. And that includes, of course, the, the so-called mystics themselves. Uh, just to, to give you the sense of it, many years ago, uh, not long before Gordy died, we took him to Hawaii with Alan, myself, and a few other folks who were involved with Falcon. And we decided, let's just go take some time in Hawaii. So we got on a plane, went there. and. Regardi uh, had gotten associated with a lovely young woman. She was about 39. He was 72 or thereabouts at the time. And uh, she was one of the very few students at a Zen monastery in Japan. Those days, early 70s, I couldn't do that kind of stuff, but she did. And she and I got talking one day, and the subject was very simple. How do you tell the difference between an enlightened master and a con man? And <laughs> we had a lot of good time playing with that one, but the conclusion was really quite obvious in the beginning. You can't. Hmm. So, uh, you've got all these folks around who are trying to tell you, I'm the guru that you should come spend your time with. Sit at my feet and I'll feed you bullshit. But we're going to pretend that it's something more than that. And then we got other people telling, well, you know, this is how you should pick your guru. This is how you should pick your master. These are the criteria to look for. And the fact is, most of that is just as nonsensical as trying to pick a good manuscript to make a book. Mm -hmm. It's all just throwing darts at a dartboard. Mm -hmm. I, I think you understand pretty well that life is mostly just happenstantial. Mm -hmm. It's just random stuff happening. Mm -hmm. The notion of you know, why good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to good people and all that stuff. It's, uh, you might as well ask again how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. It means nothing. And especially, here we are at a time when the nature of the universe is better understood than it was, well, say, go back 80 years when. The belief was that the entire universe consisted of the Milky Way galaxy. And for those who don't realize that, spend a moment looking at, at history of, of astronomy, and you'll realize that we went from, we are the center of the universe, not long back, to the Milky Way was the entire universe, big as it is, it's only one of a zillion galaxies that make up the universe. And we think we're important. We think the universe cares about us. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I guess it's somewhere in the human brain to want to find some meaning, you know? Yeah, search for meaning is a very, very important part of our existence. Frankel, who uh, was very much involved with that, my brain loses people and, and ideas sometimes. Yeah. But yeah, the, the, the search for meaning is, is part and parcel, whether you're an existentialist looking for meaning and deciding there is no such thing, or if you're a theologian and God is watching every microsecond of every microsecond of your life. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the hardest thing, I think, 
to do. Certainly the hardest thing for me has been to accept the fact... Well, it's very personal, isn't it? I think for me, meaning, you know, it's like, okay, what gives me meaning? <laughs> I think it uh, cut out there for a cut out there for a moment. Oh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I guess it's very personal meaning. You know, it's like an individual, like a like a thread, that Ariadne thing or something that we're we're pulling in to try and find out who we are on a deeper level. You know, I'm um, so get a little bit of impression. Like Falcon Press sounds like it must have been a pretty cool thing to be involved in for a long time. Like you could make. You could make money out of doing something good that was also good for, you know, people who who were interested in these writers and stuff like that. S sounds. We had a we had a, a principle that was very very evident, very clear for us. Balkan Press was all about have some fun, make a few bucks, do a little good along the way, and not necessarily in that order. <laughs> How was um? Did, did did you know Israel Lagardi so well and stuff like that? Did you uh, hang out with him more, or what was your impression? Well, I knew, knew him more. Well, first of all, I, I called him Francis because that was his given name. Uh, mm -hmm. He took on the name Israel, and that's how he was known professionally. But mm -hmm. I knew him not so much from the mystical side because I was not interested in Golden Dawn stuff. Uh, during the time that I knew him, nor have I been interested in it that much since, but uh, that was his major focus mystically. I mm -hmm. knew him more as an interesting man with interesting ideas and as someone who had taught my teacher. So for me, he, he was just a fun guy to be around. I, mean, I don't care how old he was. I, I probably met him when he was in his 60s. Mm. And he had an incredible amount of energy. Mm. Uh, in pain a lot of the times. He couldn't take a good piss on a good day. <laughs> but really just a terrific guy to be around. Mm. So I knew him in a different way than a lot of people did. And a lot of people who have read his books would be surprised, shocked even, to have seen what he was like in person. But his books were very British. He, of mm -hmm. course, was British. And so they were much more formal and structured and uh, didn't convey his own organic qualities, his own fun. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I've read any of his books that I would call fun mm -hmm. to read. Mm -hmm. But he was certainly a terrific guy to be around just to, to get a sense of what life could be like. Mm. Now mm. that I've got to be <laughs> more or less the same age that he was when he died, mm. I said, oh, well, if I can maintain that level of fun in my life, I'd be happy. Mm. Even if it is tough to take a good fish sometimes. Yeah, yeah. He was British originally, yeah? Yeah, Liverpool. Liverpool, wow. So did he have like a Scouse accent? I guess you wouldn't know what that was anyway. No, he, he had, I, I may be wrong about the Liverpool thing, but I think I've got it right. Mm -hmm. My brain sometimes loses these things. But no, he had pretty much a straight up British accent. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure he trained himself to do that. Much that, you know, I grew up in uh, New York and most people don't pick up that from my voice because I trained myself out of that accent to a large degree. Mm -hmm. And he again spoke quite British. Mm -hmm. He was he was just a fascinating man, a decent human being. Yeah, I mean it's kind of a shame, you know, that he didn't. I don't know if there is there, is there much record of him as who he was. Like you're saying, you know, he was fun and kind of good fun to hang out with and stuff like that. It'd be nice to think of a record like him. I remember reading like the Middle Pillar when I was like in my 30s, you know, and I thought it was a cool book. But of course, yeah, it's, you know, it's very formal and rigid and you do this and you breathe that or whatever, you know. Especially when you're coming to something like the Golden Dawn, which is a very structured system. Yeah, yeah. Coming out of Britain in the 1880s or something, I guess you couldn't get much more, much more structured than that. <laughs> yeah. 
you know, I was thinking as as we were talking too. I don't think I've ever read anything about Regardi. That there was somebody who wrote some alleged biography of him, Crowley's Apprentice or something. I've never read any of those. I didn't want to and don't want to. Mm. Uh, who the hell are these people to be writing about Francis anyway? Mm. But little Less, I know about Francis' yeah. background, I got from Francis. Mm. Mm. Yeah, since, yeah, it just seemed kind of a shame, I guess, because... He, he passed away in the 80s, is that right? And uh, probably wasn't so much video material of him. Right. Yeah. But, you know, he, he saved the Golden Dawn mm -hmm. uh, to the degree that exists anymore today. Mm -hmm. But to, to, to me, most of what exists is just bleached bones. And it's a bunch of people who are out there fighting over the bleached bones like a bunch of hyenas mm -hmm. uh, it, it's an okay system as far as I'm concerned it's got some value uh, in some respects it's not a bad way of looking at the world in some ways but then Judaism has been drawing the tree of life for ever and ever and the Christians just picked up on it and, and changed it around a little bit mm -hmm. but uh, for the most part the Golden Dawn is, is uh, a footnote, even in the mystical systems right now. Mm. Mm. That's okay. Yeah. The idea yeah. is you take what works and throw away the rest, and when it's no good for you anymore, when you've gotten all you can, when you've wrung it dry, toss it onto the bin and uh, go on. Yep. Yep. And let someone, if there's something needs to be, to be reinvented for a new age, then let them let them go for it you know yeah i think it's i think it's cool a lot of dead words as rajneesh might say mm, mm. i've got to go and do something in a bit so it'd be cool to bring this to a close but it's been really nice nice chatting with you nick very easy to 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 chat to chat to and uh you got anything else you'd like to communicate for a few minutes or anything you you're keen to put out or whatever? Well, I'm certainly keen to put out a plug. <laughs> so anyone who is not familiar with what we do, uh, please come to our website, originalfalcon.com. Original Falcon is all one word. Mm -hmm. And you'll find all sorts of interesting books, audios, videos uh, that we publish. You'll find a lot of uh, free material that you can look at, a lot of articles and other things that our authors have done. Some are just plain fun, some are interesting, some will hopefully uh, infuriate you. Uh, most of what we do is available in physical form, whether it's uh, CDs, DVDs, or physical books. Um, almost everything is available with downloads as well, ebooks, uh, MP3s, MP4s, things like that. And we try to keep the prices reasonable. I've noticed book prices have gone through the roof in recent years. We've tried to keep that under control as best as we can. Uh, as I say, we just want to have a little fun and make a few bucks and do a little bit of, along the way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and thank most you. Most people we deal with are uh, appreciative of that. Mm -hmm. I think it's great, you know. I think it's great. I think you're a great, man, to keep this, to keep this going and to keep the material available for people. You know, the people look around. A guy in New York was telling me he just ordered a copy of because I think you, you still do paperback of New Wings for Dallas or something. I think he said he'd ordered it and it just arrived and he's getting into it. You know, it's just someone told me there's like about five major publishing houses in the world or the West these days, you know, but it's good that there's a lot of smaller stuff that can be there and keep traditions alive and just allow people to access something a little bit different from the mainstream. So, I really want to appreciate you, Nick, for, for uh, yeah, you have fun too, but also the work that you've put in maintaining this over such a long period of time. I think that's really something. Well, if uh, anyone has any material that they'd like to send us, uh, feel free to do so, but 
be critical about it before you do so, please, because <laughs> while we don't get the same amount, same number of, of submissions as we used to years ago, uh, the percentage of good stuff versus garbage, I'm afraid, <laughs> hasn't changed very much. <laughs> I remember I wrote I wrote like a novel about I mean I write a bit now but I wrote a novel about five years ago and I was researching and I think it's something like six one in six thousand manuscripts in the UK ends up getting published and making a, a meaningful amount of money <laughs> so it's not good odds you know <laughs> yeah I mean I don't know what the numbers are anymore but many years ago uh, it was published in in the industry that something like one out of three books that are published make money. The other two out of three mm. lose money. Mm. Mind you, this is after all the curation and selection and expert testimonies and you know, one out of three. But then you also learn that something like three out of four books that are purchased are never read. Mm. Mm. So those numbers were quite horrifying. And it's very happy to me, certainly, that I can look at so much of, of our line that has been around for 40 years or more and will continue to, to be around long after I'm gone. At least mm. I hope so. Mm. Mm. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll put some, if you send me some links, uh, then I'll put those underneath the video when it comes out onto Great. YouTube for anybody. But thank you very much for making the time to speak, Nick, and uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Great. And you know, I, I learned, I think, for the first time that you've been doing some writing too. So please feel <laughs> free to take take my suggestion and send some on if you think it's worthwhile. My looking at. Oh, I'd okay. be happy. I mean, actually, I just publish. I get a printer in Poland to print it, and I just publish it myself because, yeah, you know, I, it, it makes good money. You know, it makes good money, you know, so, yeah. so uh, I kind of do that. But uh, having learned from my, my, my previous novel experience, but uh, anyway, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll sure, thank you. Right. Yeah, thank you. You didn't pick it up. We, we don't do much fiction. We actually have just published two fiction books or republished two fiction books by Joe Leshevsky. Mm -hmm. But uh, we do almost none. Mm -hmm. And it's just never been that successful for us, and it's not really that interesting, I guess, to our audience. Mm -hmm. Like, say, Bob Wilson, who did very successful nonfiction as well as fiction. Mm -hmm. But his fiction was always more successful. I mean, you can make uh, the, th the thing I also like about nonfiction is, is, you know, you can charge a decent amount of money for books. You know, uh, I, I, I did well out of my first bioenergetics book because uh, I could charge it, you know. 20 pounds, it's about nearly 30 bucks, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, you can print it for quite a lot less. And yeah, you have to do a lot of stuff to get it all together. But I mean, it's, it's, it, you can make a living out of it, you know, so it's, it's pretty cool. I've got to end it because a friend is messaging me, but I've got to go. So I'm going to just stop the recording now. <laughs>